House of Israel International Services are held weekly at 3601 Rose Lake Drive, Charlotte, North Carolina, 28217, 11 a.m. Saturday mornings and 7 p.m. Thursday evenings, Eastern Time. This live broadcast is made possible through financial contributions from brothers and sisters like you. Your financial support is greatly appreciated. Thank you. Motivating. Inspiring. Challenging. Encouraging. Deepening. Strengthening and enhancing your faith. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to House of Israel International's live worship service. Well, as I talked about, we're going to be dealing with the subject this morning that I've called the evolution of the American gospel. And as I mentioned earlier, and have from time to time over the course of the last few weeks that this is something that has been on me for some time. And the more I have traveled, the more we have done mission, missionary trips and taken missionary journeys in places like Israel and Russia and Ukraine and, and other places where other where people are using the Bible in the language that it has been translated in for them and to speak to individuals who based on their translation of the, the book who have taken positions on certain doctrinal issues even when some of those positions have been contrary to scripture and it became apparent to me my first mission trip to to Israel when I encountered Israelis who had a Israeli Hebrew translation of the American English Bible and I remember my 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 thoughts is how is it that this Hebrew people have a Bible from America translated in Hebrew. And what made me begin to think along those lines is these Israelis were having church services, worship services, just like the American churches. That the doctrines that came from America is now permeating the Israeli congregations. Now, I don't know about you, but my understanding is that the gospel originated in Israel. That's my understanding. And that from Israel, the gospel was to go to the nation. But what I came face to face with was an American gospel in the land of the Hebrews. A gospel that didn't come from Israel, a gospel that came from America. And it's like, okay, well, what is the difference between the gospel that came from Israel and the gospel that came from America? Is there a difference? And I have to tell you, ladies and gentlemen, there is a lot of differences. And we're going to look at some of those differences today. When I think about the word gospel, you know, it used to be one thought came to my mind. That's when I was just a believer in Jesus. When I was a believer in Jesus, the gospel, when I heard the gospel, it was the gospel of Jesus Christ. And so the gospel only had one meaning for me. But the more I've searched and the more I've studied, the more I have found the gospel to be confusing to various people. In fact, it is that confused gospel that have created divisions among people and established denominations. 
When I read the Bible, I don't see Pentecostals and Baptists and Methodists and Presbyterians. I do see in the Gospels and see, there we go. We got the Gospel of Mark, the Gospel of Matthew, the Gospel of Luke, the Gospel of John. We got four different Gospels right there. And we know that the Bible speaks of when Paul is writing, he said, according to my Gospel. And then he talked about another gospel. And on top of that, I read in the gospel messages and I see the gospel of Jesus Christ, the gospel of God, the gospel of the kingdom. And then there was a Baptist gospel in my first church. There was the charismatic Pentecostal apostolic faith gospel in my next church. There was the Lutheran gospel, the full gospel, the reformed gospel. And over a period of time, when I hear gospel now, I want to ask, well, what gospel are you talking about? See, I don't have just one idea of gospel now. I got a lot of them. And when I'm dealing with people about the gospel, I realize in the conversation that you're talking about one gospel and I'm talking about a different gospel. And so first of all, we need to know what gospel are we talking about if we're going to continue the conversation. This stretches our intellect. It stretches, stretches our spiritual mind. And it causes us to begin to become more specific and drill down. And the more specific and drill down we go, the less confusion. There's a, there's a lot of confusion. And so we're going to spend some time here talking about the evolution of the American gospel. And I'm just going to try to lay some, some groundwork and some, some foundation today. But I think already you all kind of got an idea of all of the different definitions or associations that emerges or show up in conversation when the word gospel comes about. In this series of teaching, I want to tell you what you should expect. I want you to know what you should gain from the teaching and what you should have after we're done. In this series of teaching, you will be able to identify and distinguish the gospel of Jehovah or the gospel of God, the gospel of Yeshua or the gospel of Jesus, the gospel of the kingdom of God. And I'll tell you right now that all of those gospels are one in the same. It's just said several ways, which, you know, to me, it's like, why didn't the translator use one particular definition instead of so many different usages of the gospel? For instance, why say the gospel of Jehovah, the gospel of God, if it's the gospel of Jesus? Or if the gospel of Jesus or Yeshua is the gospel of the kingdom. Because what I read is I read the gospel of God, the gospel of Jesus, the gospel of the kingdom. And it's hard for me to come to the same conclusion because of the use of different words that they're the same gospel. Now, maybe y'all's mind don't work like mine. But I have been forced to think a certain way because I have not called myself to ministry, but have been called to the ministry, and people look to me to have answers, which means that I got to find answers to help people walk their walk, because that's what I've been called to do. Now, for a person who hasn't been called to do certain things, then they can casually read the Bible and just figure stuff out, and come to certain conclusions, even though 
their conclusions may be incorrect because all they're going to do is have conversations with people and not a whole lot of people are necessarily looking to them for answers to biblical questions or doctrinal understanding. And this is why when people get in conversations and they can have all kinds of conversations and the conversations can go over and over and over and around and around and around. And my thing is that, you know, when I'm done with the conversation, I want to have accomplished something. I don't want to just talk for the sake of talking. And I've been in too many conversations where there's a whole lot of talking and no action. And by the time the conversation is over, we're no farther ahead than we were when we first started the conversation. It's like, you know, I don't have that kind of time anymore. <laughs> Hallelujah. So I don't want to have conversation talk just for the sake of talking. You will know what the synoptic gospels are. Now, I put this in next week, but what I want to do is I want to, well, maybe I won't. I think what I will do is I'm going to jump, do something um, that I don't normally do, but I think I need to do it. How many of you have ever heard the term synoptic gospels? Now, those of you who have studied and read, you're going to hear this term. And the synoptic gospels really embodies three gospels, and that is, or gospel um, writings, and that is the gospel of Matthew, the gospel of Luke, and the gospel of Mark. John is not part of the synoptic gospel, which is another synoptic gospel. It's like, is the synoptic gospel a different gospel than the other gospels? You see. So the synoptic gospels are called that because Matthew, Mark, and Luke generally have the same stories, although they may be rearranged or, or, or arranged a little differently, and the wording may be slightly different because, of course, um, Mark nor Luke were eyewitnesses of Yeshua. The only gospel writer that were eyewitnesses of Yeshua is Matthew and, of course, John. And, of course, there are those who question whether John, who John was. And, and I, don't, I don't, you know, I'm not trying to throw anything out there or to confuse you any further. I know you all are not confused. But the synoptic gospel doesn't include John. It only includes Matthew, Mark, and Luke. It is believed that Mark was written before Matthew, even though Matthew comes before Mark. It is also believed that Matthew and Luke pulled from Mark. Now, these are theologians having conversations based on how these gospel writings are arranged. Some time ago, when we were doing the discipleship course, I put something out there that I really never really thought about until I was forced or faced with the idea that there's a lot of writings that didn't get in the book we call the Bible. And having access to the 1611 King James and the New King James or the King James that came after 1611, it was easy to compare the two and to see that there was writings in one that were missing in the other. And then to think that all of my life I've been taught that this is the unadulterated, infallible word of Jehovah, inspired. And I'm assuming that in the days of sermons in the 16th, 11 era, that they probably held up their Bible and said, this is the infallible, inspired, unadulterated word of Jehovah. And learning in seminary that the whole canon, the process of measuring whether or not a particular book was inspired by the Holy Spirit, the responsibility was given to individuals to make those determinations. 
And so between the 1611 group and the later group who decided that the 1611 group wasn't as inspired. And I'm trying to figure, listen, folks, here's what I'm trying to do. I don't have time to play religious games. I don't have time to play church. I spent a lot of my life out there in the world trying to figure stuff out. I've come into the thing of faith to see that there's a lot of games, a lot of manipulation, a lot of denominations, a lot of beliefs, a lot of disagreement, and all I'm trying to do is find the truth. That's it. I ain't trying to make no alliances. Not trying to climb some religious denominational corporate ladder. I'm just trying to find the truth so I can live this thing out. And I'm only interested in living it out with people who want to live out the truth. All the other ones, I don't have time for it. And there's been people in my life, I've had to cut them off. I've had to say, you know what? I didn't waste enough time with you. I didn't had enough conversations with you. Our path separated some time ago. Now, if you look me up, if you find some on Facebook or you, you find out where, I'm at, where I am and you want to call and try to catch up, well, I'm going to tell you where I'm at. And if you don't want to be there, ain't no catching up to do. I'll catch you up to where I am, but if you want me to catch up to where you are and you still doing some of the things you were doing, listen, there's a lot of people out there you can be related with and friends with and have fellowship with because our fellowship is not going to last too long unless I come to the conclusion that you're as serious about this walk as I am. That's all I'm trying to do, folks. So I ain't got time for all that other stuff. One of these days, I'm going to have to stand before my master. And y'all ain't him. <laughs> you would have said. One of these days, I got it. It's, not, it's no time for, uh, 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 nope. <laughs> no time for that. And so when it came down to all of this, I had to come to the conclusion that this book that we call the Bible have been given to us by individuals who have translated it and who have used transliteration in the process of translation and who have added words because one reason is some words don't translate. But I never could understand why they put Easter in there. And so I see certain things in the Bible that says to me, there's some folks trying to fool me. And if I don't search this thing out a little different, I'm going to start following my Messiah in a paganistic, idolatrous manner. And I didn't leave the world <laughs> to get caught up in another world called religion. I'm trying to walk my faith out. And so this synoptic gospel is a means by which, and there are several assumptions. As you can see, assumption A, Matthew and Luke used Mark as a major source. And that's view number one, that it was written between 50s and 60 AD. Now, some people say, well, I don't care when it was written. It's in the Bible, and that's all that I need. Is what the word says, and that's enough for me. The Bible says it, and that's 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 all that's enough. You know what I'm saying? You've heard people like that. If the word says it, well, we have to conclude, ladies and gentlemen, that there's some stuff in here that Jehovah didn't say. And when we begin to deal with the red letter edition, and that's when, that's when it all just came out, the red letter edition. The red letter edition are the words of Yeshua as far as the gospel is saying, 
And it's like, you know, everybody wanted to get red letter and I, I had my red letter. And it's like one day it, it, it dawned on me, well, who, 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 whose words are the black? I mean, you know, it's a it's a logical question. If the red, if the words of Yeshua is in red, then that means that the stuff in black he didn't say. So who said it? And now I can begin to compare their notes with the notes of other writers and to see if there's a consistency. Because if there's two or three witnesses, I can work with that. But where there is no witness, I got more questions. Are you following me? And this is not to nitpick. This is it's like I've been fooled. My fam my parents were fooled. My grandparents were fooled. There's been a lot of fooling. Now, I can continue down the fool's way, or I can get wisdom and get knowledge and get understanding, which is only going to come from the one who gave us this because he ain't no fool, and he don't make fools. So the reason people get fooled is because they're following religion, claiming to be following him, and I'm going to follow him. That's who I need. And when I realized that Noah didn't have a Bible, Abraham didn't have a Bible, Moses didn't have a Bible, and yet these individuals walked with Jehovah. There is a possibility, folks, that we can walk with Jehovah. And then people get Bibles, and then they want to get all literal in their you know, it don't literally mean that. And this is what it literally means. It's like, okay, well, where are you getting your literal meanings from? What are you searching? What material, what tools are you using to come to that conclusion? Because when I was in seminary, and here you got PhDs in theology in one seminary, and I go to another one, you got PhDs in another seminary, and you, you're in another denomination, and you got PhDs in that denomination in theology, and all of these PhDs don't agree, and they are well-learned men. It's like... Do you hear what I'm saying? So it's like, who can I trust? Who can I trust to tell me the truth? It's obvious I can't trust men. Yeshua didn't. So I'm going to look to the one he looked to. <laughs> and when I look to him and I start looking at some others, it's like, y'all ain't saying the same thing he's saying. Or maybe I'm not just... Maybe I'm not hearing. Maybe my, my hearing needs to be adjusted because I have seen in the word things that I thought I understood and walked on only to find out later I didn't have an understanding. And when I have that kind of situation, what do I do? I don't try to defend that. I repent from that. When you know better, you do better. That's called growing. <laughs> So the assumption number two, or view number two, is Mark was written between 65 and 70. Matthew was written in the 70s. Luke was written in the 70s or later. And the assumption B, Matthew and Luke did not use Mark as a source. Mark could have been written any time between view number one, 50 and 70. View number two, Mark was written between 65 and 70. And so you've heard me say when we begin to study a book, you want to see who, who wrote it who it was written to, why it was written, and when. Because, see, these are some of the tools that is used to determine the authenticity of any writing. Because if Mark died at a certain age and later on some books emerged with Mark's name on them, then I have to say, did Mark write that? You know, we got we got books of individuals like Enoch who now have books out there with his name on it. 
apostle creeds who none of the apostles of the scripture had anything to do with. So there's a lot of theology going on, ladies and gentlemen. And if you've sat in the school of theology at the feet of the theologians, then you subscribe to their doctrine. And you follow their path. And most of us didn't have a say in the matter. We were born this way. <laughs> we were born into our faith. You went to the same church your mama went to or your daddy went to or whoever took you to church. Right? And before, by the time you got to think for yourself for real, you already had foundations established in you religious foundations that affect how you saw the world. And coming into the Hebrew roots, we come to a place to where, you know, we acknowledge we saw some stuff wrong. We moved from Sunday, which we, were, we grew up in, to keeping the Sabbath. Come to realize that, you know, the law did change but what change took place and what is, about, what is applicable today from what is not applicable and what role does Yeshua and the New Testament play in our understanding of how to live our lives out as believers and followers of Messiah. And that's what I want to try to help us with while I'm being helped. Because when you know the truth, what happens? There's freedom. And the more free you are, the less you realize you have to now try to defend yourself. Because I can't stand here defending myself, claiming he is my defender. <laughs> right? He's the one who's fighting for me. He's the one who is defending me. All I have to do is walk out what he, re what he reveals to me, and if others around me don't understand that, then I can do my best to try to explain it, but some people, no matter what you say, you're not, you're not going to be able to help them understand. They just won't get it, because they don't want to get it for some reason. And for other reasons, maybe it's not time. I don't know. So, you're going to understand and distinguish the gospel of Jehovah, Yeshua, the kingdom which you've already come to realize. You will know what the synoptic gospels are, which we just talked about. You will know what Paul's gospel is. We'll deal with that. Other gospels and what is the everlasting gospel. You will know and understand what is the true gospel. You'll be able to distinguish the difference between the gospel of Yeshua, Jesus, and the gospel Yeshua, Jesus preached. And yeah, there is a difference. And you'll be able to understand the gospel about Jesus. You will understand how the gospel Yeshua preached became the gospel of Jesus Christ. You will be able to identify the danger and pitfalls of the American gospel. You will learn how the Hebrew gospel message evolved into the American gospel and witnessed the evolution. You will understand what I mean when I say Hebrew roots gospel and why returning to our Hebrew roots gospel is so important to our faith because it's correct knowledge. There is knowledge and there is correct knowledge. You will be able to truly appreciate your salvation, the one who brought us salvation and the gospel message of salvation. You will be better equipped to understand and proclaim the true gospel of Yeshua. And that is the gospel Yeshua preached. You will understand the Hebrew roots of the gospel, the foundation of the gospel, the message of the gospel. And there are stuff you're going to understand that is not included in any of these bullet points. Webster's definition of evolution, one of a set of prescribed movements, a process of change in a certain direction. And so that's the definition of evolution based on Webster. So let's, let's, let's dig in, and we're going to start in Mark, dealing with the evolution of the American gospel. Now, Mark chapter 1, verse 1, 
the beginning, the beginning of the gospel of Yeshua, Messiah, the son of El, the son of Elohim. This word, beginning, RK, means origin. And so Mark, if you notice, he opens up with the beginning, the origin of the gospel, and is dealing with the person or thing that commences, the first person or thing in a series, the leader, that by which anything begins to be, the origin, the active cause, the extremity of a thing, and then it gets off into the corners of a cell in the first place, principality, rule, magistracy of angels and demons. And the usage here, beginning, is used 40 times, but in other places, it's called principality, this word archaic, used eight times, corner, two, and first two. And he's talking about the beginning of the gospel. And we're going to look at the Greek, and later on, we're going to look at the Hebrew. Because the word gospel you're going to find is not found, the word itself is not found in the Old Testament. But it originated there. And the problem I found, especially with people um, who have concordances and who have, you know, some different tools and, and notes is, and, and this is the thing I've noticed. Let me just share with you some things that I've noticed that it really didn't make a big difference until I started looking at things from a Hebrew roots perspective. One of the things that I noticed is that in Bible college, the focus was on the Greek portions of the scriptures, not the Hebrew. And at the time, it was no big deal because Jesus wasn't in the Old Testament. And all I wanted to focus on was Jesus because I was being taught to teach Jesus to a people who believe Jesus or believe in Jesus. So that's, that's where, so it, it didn't really matter. But also the tools, the Bible tools, uh, the online tools and the, um, the electronic tools, uh, the, the disc, the, the, the library that you, you develop. I look that some Hebrew words are not as clearly defined as the Greek words. You see. I also noticed very clearly that there were words used in the Greek portion of the Bible that weren't used in the Hebrew portion of the Bible, which originated from the Hebrew portion of the Bible. I acknowledged and identified that the Greek Bible seemed to be totally distinct from the Hebrew portion of the Bible. And it never really dawned on me. I didn't think much of it until I started searching the Hebrew roots of my faith. And so this word gospel, and it is euangelion. You won't find this word in the Hebrew portion of the Bible. You'll find another word we'll discuss later. But this word evolved from there. It took on a total different identity than the original. And it's difficult to make it's difficult to make that connection from the new connecting it to the old. And based on the new, it is as, as if it don't even exist. Another word you won't find in its name form is the word Jesus. You won't find Jesus in the Old Testament, 
but he's littered through the New Testament, which leads some to believe Jesus didn't exist until Matthew. When the entire Old Testament and none of these individuals would disagree point to him. It points to him, but his name is not mentioned and the translators decide to put Emmanuel. Wonderful counselor, when the fact is his name is there, it's just hidden. And if you don't know where to look, you won't find it. <laughs> and so this word meaning a reward for good tidings. Now, how many of you, you automatically you say, blessed are they who bring good news. Blessed are the, how beautiful are the feet of them that bring good news. See, there is gospel. But it's not called gospel. Because the word here said what? Re, a reward for good tidings, good tidings, the glad tidings of the kingdom of Elohim, soon to be set up, soon to be set up. It's like Jehovah set up his kingdom from the beginning. But let these guys tell it, he's not going to set it up until after Jesus died. <laughs> right? The, the usage, gospel 46 times, gospel of Christ 11 times, gospel of God 7 times, gospel of the kingdom Three times, same word. Yeshua is the salvation of Jehovah first preached, or should I say announced, by Jacob in Genesis chapter 49, verse number 18. Here's what it says. I have waited for thy salvation, O Lord. That's the King James. The word there, salvation, is what? I have waited for Yeshua. <laughs> now that's the translation of the word salvation in that passage. But you see salvation. Now here's what this is going to point to. Who is our salvation? Nobody argues that. He is our salvation. And so he, he is our salvation but there were those who didn't know him by that name or, get this, if Jacob spoke Hebrew and he's speaking Hebrew, here's what he's saying. Oh, I've waited for your Yeshua, Jehovah. That's what he would, say, that's what he would be saying. He wouldn't have used salvation because salvation is translated in the Hebrew, and if he was speaking Hebrew, he would have used the Hebrew, right? So he would he would have been speaking Yeshua, would he not? Yeshua, salvation, deliverance, welfare. And I'm not talking about government welfare. But the government of his kingdom. See, I don't mind being on the welfare system of his kingdom. <laughs> and if I get desperate enough, I'll take some welfare from Uncle Sam. I'm just putting it out there. My pride, if it's still exists, will not let me go hungry when somebody is saying, here's some food. Take this EBT. Take this food stamp. Now, if the food stamp goes to the grocery store and I'm hungry, what am I supposed to do? Die? Would you die? I ain't dying. Pride will not take me to my grave. <laughs> But the welfare of his kingdom, salvation, deliverance, welfare, prosperity, 
All of these words are tied. Deliverance, salvation, victory. So Yeshua is my deliverance. Yeshua is my salvation. Yeshua is my victory. Yeshua is my welfare. Yeshua is my prosperity. He's my help. He's my health. He's my saving. My savior. This is what Jacob is saying. And that word, Yehovah, meaning Yehovah, the existing one, the proper name of the one true Elohim, unpronounced except with the vowel pointing. And so when people say yad hey vav hey, which is what we have here, and for whatever reason, I got to get a better translation of Hebrew lettering because, as you can see from here, we've got, excuse my, we've got the vowel pointing that is not included in the yad hey vav hey. And how many of you know yud hey vav hey is nobody's name? So when people are talking about, oh, I thank you, yud hey vav hey, it's like, really? You're going to say, well, I thank you, A-R-T-H-U-R. Well, not, is, is, is A-T-H-R. You know, A-T-H-R is not my name. I know you guys got this tech stuff going on where you just shorten everything. And now, folks, it's like they're ridiculously shorting stuff, and the only people who can't read it is the ones who can't read it. Everybody else pretend like they understand what they're saying. <laughs> Yeshua was also announced by Moses in Exodus chapter 14 and 15, and this is what it says. And Moses said unto the people, Fear not, stand still, and see the Yeshua of Jehovah." which he will show you today. For the Egyptians whom you seen today, you shall see them again <laughs> no more forever. And then he says in Exodus 15, Jehovah is my strength and the song, and he is become my Yeshua. He is my Elohim, and I will prepare him an habitation, my father's El. And I will exalt him. Jehovah is a man of war. Jehovah is his name. A man of war. He's going to fight for you. You see, we have, to, we have to learn to truly let him do the fighting. If, if, we, if we really let him do the fighting, you know what we avoid? We avoid strife. We avoid contention. We avoid high blood pressure. We avoid a lot of health issues that come when we get all worked up. And then time I, I'm not going to fight you. The Lord fights my battles. It's like, well, what do you call that? <laughs> See, some people fight with words. And we have to learn, we're talking about waiting on him, is the author of the confusion. The Bible says that where there is strife and where there is contention, there is confusion and every evil work. So wherever strife and contention, there's confusion. And strife, ladies and gentlemen, it can hurt you pretty bad. It can mess with your organs, your system, your brain, your heart, your vitals. I mean, it's like you don't want to be in strife. And you certainly don't want to operate in confusion because when you're in that camp, you're in the camp of the enemy. How are you going to go and take some out the enemy's camp when you got some stuff that belonged to him? You go over there for a fight and end up in jail. <laughs> And that word again, Yeshua, salvation, deliverance, welfare, Yehovah. Then Mark chapter 1, back to, to Mark. The beginning of the gospel of Yeshua Messiah, the son of Elohim. Now here's where I want to point out 
this word Jesus, we know we found it in in Yeshua. That's the name we use. It is in the Greek, Jesus or Jesus, Jesus, and that word is supposed to mean Jesus equals Jehovah or Jehovah is salvation, and <clears throat> another is Joshua. And so some people pronounce um, that because Jesus came from the Hebrew origin of Joshua, that the name is Yehoshua. And so when people say Yehoshua, they mean Yeshua, or they mean Jehovah is salvation. But people who use the name Jesus... They, they, they say and think that that is what it means as well. And yet, we know that Jesus is certainly not the name his mother named him. Because Jesus is neither Latin, nor is it Greek, nor is it Hebrew. It's not even old English. It's modern English. Because anyone who has a 1611 King James Bible, the 1611 King James Bible is Old English, which is a Anglo-Saxon English that evolved into what we know today as American English. And so when you try to read that Anglo-Saxon English, any of you who try to read from the King James Bible, you probably get through a few verses before you put that down and pick up something that you can read and understand because it's a little difficult, but that's how people spoke. We don't speak that way today. Why? Because we have evolved. And the more we evolve, the more we, when we, when we evolve into, we evolve away from. You hear what I'm saying? And that's why we're, we're, we're calling this the evolution. And so Joshua, Jehoshua, is salvation. Jehovah is salvation. And he gives him son of none. Now, Christos. This is the Greek. Christos, meaning Christ, equal anointed. And then Christ was the Messiah. And some of you noticed when I showed you in John chapter 4, when the woman says, we know Messiah come, which being interpreted is called Christ. So it's basically, we know Christ coming. Being interpreted is Christ. It's like, why you give him Messiah and evolve him into Christ, which is anointed, when in actuality, Messiah is much broader than anointed. Messiah, king, priest, savior. Messiah is all that, not just anointed, but king, priest, savior. Yeshua, the salvation of Jehovah is the literal gospel, literally. Yeshua is salvation. Now, Yeshua, the literal gospel, also preached the gospel. So when Yeshua was teaching, he was the gospel and he was preaching the gospel. So what was he preaching about? Himself. That's what he was preaching about. Himself. The gospel was saying, listen, if you want to be saved, you got to believe in me. And he was talking to a people who said, you must be out of your mind. We believe in God. And when Yeshua said, you know, well, you're looking, if you, if, you, if, if you believe in him, you would believe in me because if you've seen him, you've seen me, he and me, we're one. What? <laughs> People had a real problem with that. And I, I suspect that the people had a real problem with that because it's easier to believe in one you can't see 
especially if he ain't talking and he don't talk. So we interpret what we think he's saying and we can rely on our own interpretation. Do you hear this? Now here one comes and says, listen, no, you can't rely on your own interpretation. Let me tell you what he's saying. Let me tell you what he means. That's why I'm here. I'm here to save you. We already saved. We don't need you, is what they're saying. Yeshua the gospel, verse 14, John, uh, Mark, Mark 1. Now after that John was put in prison, Yeshua came into Galilee preaching the gospel, the gospel of the kingdom of Elohim. So the gospel was preaching the gospel. That's the simplest way of saying it. The message of the gospel declared Yeshua is the salvation of Jehovah. That's the message. The forerunner of this message was pronounced by the prophet as it is written, verse 2, Mark 1. In the prophets, behold, I send my messenger before thy face, which shall prepare thy way before thee. The voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare ye the way of the Lord. Make his paths straight. The voice of him, and this is prophesied, this is coming as it is written. Remember, when you see as it is written, you want to find out where it's written. This is how you compare scripture. This is how you search scripture. This is how you, 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 you be Berean. Bereans search the scriptures to see that if, if now, now I want you to see this. The Bereans, the Bible says, search the scriptures. Right? What did they search? People talking about, well, I'm a Berean. It's like, well, if you were a Berean, you'd be searching the scriptures the Bereans search. Now, Paul is coming to preach the gospel, right? Now, if Paul was preaching something other than what the scriptures said, when they searched the scriptures, they wouldn't have found Paul's teaching. When they searched the scriptures, they were searching the Old Testament. What were Paul preaching from? Paul was preaching Messiah from the Old Testament. Why? Yeshua said to the Pharisees, search the scriptures. For therein they speak of me. You think you got salvation? <laughs> search. You're rejecting salvation. That's what he's saying to them. Your salvation is looking you straight in your face and trying to show you the way. So when he says, I am the way, I'm the path, I'm the, I'm, I am salvation personified. Are you getting this? And so that come from Isaiah 40, the voice of him that crieth in the wilderness, prepare you the way of the Lord, prepare you the way of Jehovah, make straight the desert, a highway for our Elohim. And then John goes on, to, um, Mark goes on saying, John did baptize in the wilderness and preach the baptism of repentance for the remission of sin. So now we get to see what was John preaching because Yeshua, we're going to see, starts preaching what John was preaching after John was put in prison. What was John preaching? The baptism of repentance. So John was preaching the gospel as the forerunner of Messiah, preparing the way for the Messiah. And so when John was put away, Yeshua began to preach, pick up where John was preach, speaking, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Repent. Repent from what? Sin. I'm going to look at this in a moment, but this word, he says, preach. Caruso, meaning to be a herald, to officiate as a herald, to proclaim after the manner, always with the suggestion of formality, gravity, to publish, proclaim openly something which has been done. And its usage, 51 times preach, five times publish, two times proclaim and preach and preacher. Now, the reason why I'm pointing this out is because 
what we have here is the messenger and the message. One who proclaims the message and the message one proclaims. Sometimes people get confused, the messenger, with the message. Sometimes if we, see, here's the thing, if we can, if we can discredit the messenger, we can reject the message. If we can discredit the messenger, we can reject the message. So how do you discredit the message? You find flaw. You find a problem. Think about how we do. When somebody comes to us, I do it. And I have to, I have to reject that because the thought is automatic. When somebody comes to me to correct me, I could think probably a dozen things that I can throw back at them. It's like, you know, you coming to tell me about myself and, you know, a good passage, before you come to tell me about the moat in my eye, brother, you need to take that big old log. Out of you. you see how we do? We can find a problem with the person who is pointing stuff out to us, and the question is, why? Why do we do that? Because we don't want to hear what they got to say. Now, the sad thing is, is that what they got to say, if it's of him, is for our good. Which says that we choose stuff that is against that which is good when the Almighty sends stuff to us which is for our good by discrediting the messenger, we can discredit the message which is supposed to be good for us whereas we reject what is good and it never manifests or materializes. And see, here's what I found. Here's what I found. I'm asking the Father to do some stuff for me. And he want to do some stuff for me, right? He want to do some stuff. But he also know that if he do what I want him to do, if I don't deal with this, when he does for me what he wants me, what I want him to do, I'm going to mess it up. See, the devil got dirt on all of us. Don't you think for a moment the devil ain't got no dirt on you? He, it's like, it's like politicians during the election cycle. They got their minions out there finding all the dirt on their opponent. And they release a little dirt at certain times to knock them down. When they get to a certain place, then they release some WikiLeaks. They release some, they leak some information. Oh, I didn't know that. I was about to vote for that person. I'm glad, I'm glad I found that out. Right? And so the enemy, he waits until you get to a certain place. And you think your sin ain't going to find you out. And right when you get to that place, here come the blackmailers who know the stuff. Here come the people who is threatening to expose. So what do you do? You confront the issue in you so that when the blackmailers come, they ain't got nothing to blackmail you with. And how do you do that? Father, send people to you to share things with you that you don't want to hear and you discredit the messenger and keep carrying your blackmailable stuff along with you. So when you get to that point now, you got all these issues that is arising over stuff you never dealt with that keep you from enjoying that which you thought would be most flavorful. See how this stuff works? This is why. You can't look at the messenger before you examine the message. So the messenger was John. John was not the message. 
But here's what the people is. Religion. This is why the religious leaders asked the messenger if he was the message. Are you the one? Are you the prophesied Messiah? And what did John t say? No. He, the message, was coming. So John answered them saying, I baptize with water, but there one stand among you whom you know not. He it is who coming after me is preferred before me, whose shoes, latches, I'm not worthy to unloose. Don't confuse the message with the messenger. What did he come to do? He come to preach repentance, proclaim, herald repentance for the remission of sin. Now, you got to understand something, folks, because the Hebrew people, of all people, had a better understanding of sin than we do. Because the prophets, I mean, when you look at Israel, Israel have gone in and out of captivity because of violating Jehovah's commands. And because Jehovah loves them, he always has a voice, a remnant. So he raises up a prophet, sends the prophet to the people, say, hey, people, y'all need to turn back. Y'all need to repent. You know, I told you in my word, if you don't obey my word, these things are going to happen. So this should not be new to you that you're going into captivity. It's an example. It's a sign that you're walking in obe disobedience to my word. But if you turn back to me, guess what? I'll turn back to you. When we violate the commands of Jehovah, we turn on him. It's not he turning on us. We turn on him and we keep we 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 put him in a position to where he can't bless you. You hear people talking about I'm blessed in my mess. No, you're not. No, you're not. You ain't blessed in no mess. Father don't bless mess. He cleans it up. The prophets knew that sin put a barrier between the creation and the creator. Sin keeps fathers like fathers say, I want to bless him. I want to bless him. I want to bless him. They won't let me. I want to bless them. So I got to, I got to, I got to, I got to get a blessing to them. So here's the plan. Okay. I know you were over there tending your flock, tending your sheep, but I got, hey, you, you, yeah, you, come here. I got something to, I'm going to send you to tell these people, not me, Lord, find somebody else. So now I want you to go and tell these people why, because I want to bless them. But I can't bless them in the condition they're in. I got to get a message to them so if they would re repent, if they would turn and, and, and turn to me, then all these blessings that I want to bless them with, I can bestow upon them before they sin again. <laughs> it's like the father got to try to get in between our sin to get some blessings to us. And, and I believe that he's trying to get in between the last time we sin and the next time we sin to get some blessings to us. So hopefully the blessings will speak to us and we'll compare the blessed times when we're walking with him with the other times when we're not walking with him and say, hey, you know, I just had an epiphany. It seems like life is better when I'm walking in obedience to his word. Go figure. So what would that do is hopefully an intelligent person, a wise person, will make a decision to walk in obedience because curses don't pay. Disobedience don't pay. Crime don't pay. See, when you violate the law, that makes you a criminal. When we violate Jehovah's law, that makes us a criminal. Crime don't pay. Let me finish. Well, let me, I'm always from finishing. Whew. Sin 
this word, what did he say? John came to declare the, the baptism of repentance for the remission of sin. He says you got to repent so that your sins will be blotted out, wiped out. Well, why? Because sin, ladies and gentlemen, is equivalent to to be without a share, to miss the mark, to err, to be mistaken, to miss or wander from the path of uprightness and honor, to do or go wrong, to wander from the law of God, to violate God's law. That which is done wrong, sin and offense, a violation of the divine law in thought or in act. So when a Hebrew person hears repent from sin, their first question is, what sin? Now the religious leader says, we're not sinners. What made the religious leaders sinners? One simple violation which led to many more. And that simple violation was adding to adding to the law. Jehovah says, do not add. My law is perfect just the way it is. Don't add nothing to it. Don't take away from it. Don't diminish it. And don't try to, you know, hype the, you know, I'm the one who gave it. I'm the one who knows the interpretation. And if my people who know me, if my people who know me and had the kind of relationship that I want to establish, because see folks, back at Sinai, Jehovah's plan was not to write his law in stones. His, his plan then was to write his law in the heart of men. How? Hearing. Hearing. Faith Faith comes by hearing. Jehovah's saying, listen, y'all come up. Let me talk to y'all. Let me tell you. Listen, I came. I went. I sent Moses through a lot to bring you all out of, out of, out of uh, Egypt. I've, I promised Abraham I'm going to take you into a land that is a good land, this land I have prepared just for you, similar to how he prepared the garden for Mr. and Mrs. Adam. It's like everything that they needed would be in the land. They didn't build the houses. They didn't dig the wells. They didn't plant the vineyards. It says everything I, I, I'm going to bring you from slavery is that I'm going to take you from the bottom of the heap and put you on the top of the hill. This is what he's doing here. He's taking them from slave, looked down on, to being the light of the world, looked up to. And this is what the Almighty will do for you, but we have to allow him to have his way in us. He know how to take you from wherever you are and put you where he has ordained for you to be. But along the way, he got to get some stuff out of us because we picked up some stuff before we came to the knowledge of who he is. We picked up some stuff before we came to the full knowledge of who he is. And the stuff that we picked up, it affects our outlook on him. And, and, and as, a res, as a result of that, because the stuff that has happened to many of us have caused us to distrust and we can't make, for some reason, the distinction between trusting him whom we can't see and men who we can. So if we can't trust that which we see, how in the world are we going to trust that which we can't see, which causes us to give lip service? We say we trust him, but our actions don't show that. All of the things that we've gone through, accumulated, the stuff people have done to us, men, I mean, all of that stuff is, is, is part of that carnal human nature. And, and, and so when, 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 when human beings say or do stuff that remind us of other human beings who did or said things similar and then did what they did, it conjures up 
all of those memories and those memories because not being grounded in the word and probably not wearing seats and not focused on keeping the commands causes us to remember that stuff which exalt itself over remembering the word. And we begin to walk in the hurt begin to walk in or we begin to protect ourselves. We begin to guard ourselves and say, he is my high tower. He is my fortress. And we don't realize, ladies and gentlemen, but we become accustomed to offering lip service. And we convince ourselves with the lip service that we give him that our lip service is genuine and authentic and we believe our own. I know what I'm talking about. Mark 1.5. And there went out unto him all the land of Judea and they of Jerusalem and were all baptized of him in the river of Jordan, doing what? Confessing their sins. Now, for the Gentile today, the non-Hebrew person today, it's like when they say sin and when people hear sin today, sin in the mind of a church person has evolved from what sin in the mind of a Hebrew person was. When a Hebrew person heard sin, you know what came to them? The law. When a Christian hears sin, you know what comes to them? An act. And we have to look at sin in the context of sin. So, you know, when, 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 when I talk sin, it's not that I'm conscious of sin as much as it is I'm conscious of the law. And don't want to be one who violate the law because I know when I violate his law, then I put this, this separation. And the last thing I want is to be, is to have anything between the Almighty and me, which is why we have to be quick to repent. We have to be quick to hear. We have to be slow to speak. We have to be slow to anger. But this flesh don't want to hear that. Your flesh don't want to hear that. I know my flesh don't. So they, they hear sin. They think of law. Christians and Messianic some hear sin. And they think of an act. See? So I may not be guilty of one thing, but there are some other things that I may be aware of that I need to work on. And the whole point is that I want to work on everything that I'm aware of, but it's painful. Because to work on these issues mean that I got to deal with my flesh. And you know how you don't like dealing with other people's flesh? You certainly don't want to deal with your own. It's easier to deal with other people's flesh than your own flesh, and you don't like dealing with other people's flesh. So what does that say about you and yours? I have to work on mine, and I have to work on it every day. And, and Father puts people in my, life, in my life and circumstances and situations that keep me reminded that I got work to do. And John was clothed with camel's hair and with the girdle of a skin about his loins, and he did eat locusts and wild honey, and preached, saying, There cometh one mightier than I after me, the latchet of whose shoes I am not worthy to stoop down and unloose. I indeed have baptized you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit, Holy Ghost. <clears throat> and it came to pass in those days that Yeshua came from Nazareth of Galilee and was baptized of John in Jordan. And straightway, coming up out of the water, he saw the heavens open and the spirit like a dove descending upon him. And there came a voice from heaven saying, Thou art my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. And immediately the spirit driveth him into the wilderness. Now, John tells us, well, 
he was driven, or, or Luke tell us, he was driven into the wilderness for what? To be tempted of the devil. John Mark says, and immediately the spirit driveth him into the wilderness, and he was there in the wilderness 40 days, tempted of Satan. And was with the wild beasts. Now, Luke says he was driven into the wilderness to be tempted, or he was led into the wilderness to be tempted. It's not that he was in the wilderness and the devil came to tempt him. It was the purpose of tempting him. And what was the devil's job? Was to cause him to confront that flesh. You said, well, you sure didn't, didn't have to deal with the flesh, really? You know, get to the point to where the, 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 the climax of his life and purpose in the garden, and remember, he was in there praying for three, three hours. Now, here's the thing. He prayed for three hours, and after the prayer, he did what he was praying he didn't have to do. And so I say, you know, that was three hours of, for what? Because this flesh is something else. This flesh don't want to do Jehovah's will. And that's a lesson we can learn from it. But in the end, it was a three-hour prayer that didn't change what he was praying for. Now, after that, John was put in prison. Yeshua came into Galilee preaching the gospel of the kingdom of Elohim and saying the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of Elohim is at hand do what see here's the gospel in the nutshell folks repent ye and believe repent ye and believe the gospel now I'm gonna give you a couple more things and then we're gonna we're gonna bring this to a close and pick up next week the American gospel that is preached in the corporate American churches which identifies Christianity did not originate with Yeshua. In fact, what is preached today in the corporate American westernized church is very different from the gospel that Yeshua preached in his day. The gospel that is being exported from America and impacting churches and religious life worldwide is a western version of the gospel that originated with the Hebrew Messiah called Yeshua. And as I said, as we go through these teachings, what you're going to find is that the things that we deal with today, the gospel message that we're dealing with today, has, has, has gone through some changes. The gospel we know today in America has gone through several phases or transitions, all versions, however you look at them, every last one of them. Doesn't matter which version you got. You can have the closest version there is, and it came from something. It came from something. So here's, 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 the, uh, here's the evolution, and we'll deal with this um, more uh, later. The Americanized gospel before it was Americanized was westernized. Before it was westernized, it was Europeanized. Before it was Europeanized, it was Latinized. Before it was Latinized or Latin, it was Greek-sized. Before it was Greek-sized, it was Aramaic and Hebrew. Now, if you reverse the order, here is the evolution the gospel has gone through. And again, we'll deal with this a little bit more uh, in another teaching. So the gospel, the message has gone from Hebrew Aramaic to Greek, from Greek to Latin, from Latin to European, westernized, Anglo-Saxon or Old English, from European, westernized, Anglo-Saxon, Old English to American English, and then from American English to the various translations of the Bible that are shipped around the world. And I want to stop here. I want to say that, you know, I just got, I just got a letter, uh, and we get several uh, letters from people for Bible, Bible, Bible translations in their language. 
You know, we've even gone through the process and 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 this is one of the things that really it it just it just opened my eyes as 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 studied as I am and as knowledgeable as I thought I was in the process of getting some of our material translated from the English to another language and we've got several materials we've got we've got Sunday is not the Sabbath that is translated in Hebrew uh, in uh, Spanish is translated in Shauna is translated in Dutch is translated in in um, Russian and there's another translation okay it's going to be in Cebu um, but but the point is is that these translation processes forced us to look at words we normally wouldn't even be looking at because of them being translated into another language. And when they were being translated into another language, it dawned on me as, as Sister Simona and um, Sister PJ was, was working on it, and Sister Simona, who was helping to kind of guide this um, Russian version as we were also translating our discipleship program into Russian. And she, and I remember some of the conversations she was having with me. It's like, really? Are you serious? Yes, Arthur, brother. <laughs> And she said, brother, she says, yes, that, that word, when you translate it into our language, it doesn't say that. So now you got to find the correct word, which, you know, to make it translate properly. It's not that you just, you know, go to Google and translate me and you got it. It don't work that way. And then when you start dealing with the, the Spanish and, you know, when um, Sister Rebecca is is working on it and then you got you know who is from puerto rican descent and then you got people who speak different dialects other than puerto rican who is spanish and they're looking at it and saying this and saying that and it's like you got to deal with all these dialects even now you got a language and i'm thinking as i'm going and 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 i got and i remember i remember and, and this was probably one of the most mind-blowing teaching opportunities that I've ever had. When I went to Kenya the second time, and we ended up in Lodwa, which is almost about 30 miles from the Sudan desert, or yeah, the Sudan wilderness. And we were there speaking, and I had three translators. Now I've worked with one. I've even worked with as many as two. But having someone take my English and translate it into Swahili and take my Swahili, take the Swahili and somebody else to translate it into Kikuyu and to take the Kikuyu and translate it into another language and then have somebody translate it into the local language. Now I got all of these translations and I don't know what nobody's saying. So I'm standing there preaching and I have to trust that the translators are translating what I'm saying. Now this really messed, messed me up when somebody in the audience correct the translator. Now I didn't know the translator was wrong. You hear what I'm saying? And so when somebody's correcting the translator who's translating for me and it's like, well... You know, now it's like, are you really saying what I'm saying? You, you understand what I'm saying, ladies and gentlemen? So as we're going to look at this evolution of the gospel, the American gospel, we're, we're looking at it from where it came from to us and how it came through that process to us and now how it's going through another process from us. Because whether you know it or not, America is the, is the largest exporter of translations of the Bible than any other country. 
and the culture is being translated. The doctrine, the denominational beliefs are being translated. You get this. And so when we go out to speak to people who've got the American version in their language and we're bumping heads and I'm trying to show them a Strong's Concordance does them absolutely no good. None of the Hebrew tools, no lexicon, no concordance, because those things haven't been translated yet. So all you got is the pure word from their translation, and to them, that's what it says, and you can't show them the Hebrew or the Greek. You get it? And now I'm looking at what we've done as people and how we're affecting. And this is why I would say out of the hundreds of years, do you know that the gospel, the gospel that has been in existence, think about this, the gospel that has been in existence for at least 1900 to 2000 years in a world of over 7 billion people have only reached about 2.5 billion in over 2000 years. Not to mention the fact that this gospel has been translated and denominationalized that seem to have caused more divisions than unities. And it causes me to look at the enormity of the responsibility that we have been given and the enormity of the responsibility that we've been given to take the true gospel of the kingdom to the ends of the world becomes somewhat overwhelming. Because I'm thinking this won't be done in my lifetime. Now, maybe I'm wrong. But if it's taken 2,000 years to reach 2.5 billion people, that is not even a third. Well, maybe it's a little over a third of the world's population, 2,000 years. I, I, I anticipate I'll live beyond uh, 100, but I don't think I'll be living for 2,000 years. And so the best chance we have is to get as many people equipped with the true gospel to impact and influence as many people as we can in our little lifetime of 100 to 120 years. You get that? So it's not about us playing, and this is why we're trying to get on TV. This is why we're on the Internet. This is why we're pushing and pushing and getting information out there because we've got an enormous, enormous challenge ahead of us to reach the world for the kingdom. Amen. Father, I thank you for your presence and power, for your calling. Seeing how the prophets of old became overwhelmed, thinking there was only them where you've re made them see that there are a remnant. I thank you for connecting that remnant. I know we're not alone. Doesn't mean it don't feel that way, and I know you know that sometimes. Help us to make the right connections. Help us to be true and faithful to this calling and not deviate and compromise it because we know too many lives hang in the balance. I pray that you will continue to show us your salvation. Continue to reveal your will and your plan 
and how to help us to gain as much ground as we possibly can in the time you've allotted us. And so we just take the, the moment now to thank you. Thank you. Thank you for giving us ears to hear and eyes to see. Thank you for bringing us to this realization. Thank you for delivering us and saving us and healing us and showing us your salvation. Now help us to walk in it in the fullness. Help us to declare your goodness, your good news, as we understand the intricacies of the evolution of the American gospel and to avoid the pit, pitfalls and the traps that have been established in that gospel. We want the true gospel of the kingdom to take forth the true gospel of the kingdom, for we know that it is the true gospel that set men free. And we want to be those who set captives free, not put them in bondage. We thank you, we bless you, we honor you in Yeshua's name. Amen. Shalom, saints. Tithing and giving first fruit offerings are critical parts of the believer's faith and has its foundation back in Genesis 4-4 when Abel brought of the firstlings of his flock and of the fat thereof. And Jehovah had respect unto Abel and to his offering. Abel was commended by Jehovah in Hebrews 11:4, where it states that by faith, Abel offered unto God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain, by which he obtained witness that he was righteous, God testifying of his gifts, and by it he being dead yet speaketh. Solomon said in Proverbs 3, 9, and 10, Honor Jehovah with thy substance and with the first fruits of all thine increase. So shall your barns be filled with plenty, and your presses shall burst out with new wine. The prophet Malachi wrote in chapter 3, verse 11 and 12, to bring ye all the tithe into the storehouse, that there may be meat in mine house, and prove me now, he with, says Jehovah of hosts, if I will not open you the windows of heaven and pour you out a blessing, that there should not be room enough to receive it. And I will rebuke the devourer for your sakes, and he shall not destroy the fruits of your ground, neither shall your vine cast her fruit before the time in the field, says Jehovah of hosts. And all nations shall call you blessed, for you shall be a delightsome land, said Jehovah of hosts. When we tithe and give offerings consistently in obedience to Jehovah's commandments, we can count on him to keep his promises to us and consistently meet all of our needs. It is our Father's desire to bless you. However, it begins with you and your act of obedience to tithe and give offerings. Do it today. Shalom. For more information, visit www.arthurbaileyministries.com or call 888 888- 899-1479. House of Israel International Services is made possible through financial contributions from brothers and sisters like you. Thank you.